Um, okay, so um, I think there's already uh, one sort of final problem in the homework for um, that has to do with column friction. Uh, so I thought I would give up. That problem is largely self-contained based on previous things that we have done. And we've given a couple of lines of remarks about how column friction works. Uh, but I thought we would expand on it uh, briefly. And then this is a topic that we will come back to uh, later in the course as well in more detail and greater complexity, I suppose. Okay. So friction, you all know what that term means. Um, and at least for the purposes of this course, um, broadly two classes of friction, uh, dry friction, which is the uh, friction between um, essentially dry surfaces. There is no liquid between uh, the two surfaces. Um, so car tire against the ground, if the ground is not, um, it doesn't have water, I guess it's not a rainy day, um, or uh, table against the floor, um, your uh, coffee mug against your table, etc. So dry friction. And then viscous friction or wet friction, um, they're not necessarily interchangeable terms, but, but friction involving sort of flu fluidic effects, I suppose, broadly construed, um, which could be lubrication or friction between solid and liquid and so on. So when we say Coulomb friction, we mean the latter, um, dry friction between solids largely. If you have like a, a lubricating liquid between the two surfaces, things get modified a bit. Uh, but, but because friction is so ever present uh, and a lot of friction is uh, dry friction, uh, we like to study that separately. And it's kind of the simplest perhaps kind of friction that you can imagine. Um, and uh, again, these are terms perhaps that you're familiar with. Coulomb friction is what you guys you would have heard of as static friction and kinetic friction uh, in a previous course, perhaps in your statics course. So this is kind of a review, except in a dynamics context. Um, so it's useful to consider a very simple example. Um, I guess my handwriting is not greatest, but let me just read through it. Uh, consider a block, okay, sitting on a table. So here's a block, here's a table, this is a block sitting on a table, and then you're pushing it with F sub EXT, F external, okay? This is a block, you're pushing this with some external force. Um, and then you can draw a free body diagram for the block. There's mass MG downwards, there's a normal reaction upwards, there's force external, on the block that you apply. This is a horizontal force, let's say. Um, and then potentially there is some friction force, um, which I've drawn in red color. Uh, and the question is, what is this friction force? What is the value of this friction force? Do people have guesses? It looks like people are posting on the chat window. Um, various folks are saying mu times um, mg or mu times the normal reaction. Okay, this is this was a slight trick question. Okay, give, uh, let me give you more hint. So uh, the mu times mg or mu times normal reaction is a, is a correct answer. It is a possible correct answer, but it's not always true. When is it not true? Uh, someone asks, is the block moving constant velocity F friction equals F external when stationary? Okay, uh, a couple of folks are asking about um, block moving and uh, static friction and so on. Exactly, so okay, that's the issue. Um, that's exactly the issue. Um, Right, so is the block moving or not, first of all, um, is, is the key question. If the block is moving, then the force is um, mu kinetic times normal reaction. But if the block is not moving or slipping against the surface, then it really depends 
Um, so here's the um, sort of the full version of uh, Coulomb friction. If, if the block is not moving, let's say it's just sitting on the table, um, and we apply this F external force, um, if F external is small enough, right? If it's small enough, quote unquote, whatever that means, we haven't defined what that means. If it's small enough, then friction force exactly cancels out this external force in a manner that this thing continues to sit right there, right? So for small enough F, FEXT, the friction force equals the external force so that it continues to not slip or not accelerate, right? And this is what we call static friction. Um, F friction equals the external force, at least in this simple example, um, if F external is small enough. And then what do we mean by small enough? This inequality is what we mean by small enough. Um, if the friction force is less than mu sub s times n, then um, you're okay. Um, the mass will just sit there and not slip. Um, but if the S external exceeds mu sub s times n, in other words, this is called static friction, mu sub s times n is called the static friction, it is the maximum friction force available between the two surfaces. Um, so there is this mass and this surface. There is friction force between the two surfaces. It turns out that the friction force cannot be arbitrarily large. There is a maximum friction force that the two surfaces interacting can provide. And that maximum friction force, uh, when the two objects are not moving relative to each other, is called static friction or um, mu, mu s times n, okay? Um, so when the F external exceeds that, um, then F, F friction will still be equal to mu s times n, but F external will be greater, so it'll start accelerating and slipping. But when F external is less than this quantity, mu s times n, F friction will not be equal to mu s times n, will actually be exactly equal to whatever you're applying, so that it exactly cancels it out. And uh, yeah, so when it's not slipping and when F external is less than this quantity, F friction is actually equal to F external. And then yeah, as you keep increasing F external, when F external exceeds this quantity, um, F friction will, well, well, will not be able to provide more than this quantity and it will start slipping, okay? So that's about static friction. And then once it starts slipping, in other words, when F external greater than mu s times n and the mass starts slipping, um, when it starts slipping, then we have what's called kinetic friction, where basically the magnitude of the friction force is mu k times n, where mu is some uh, small number, usually less than one, but not always, but usually less than one. Um, and mu k is called the kinetic friction coefficient, mu s is called the static friction coefficient. Okay, um, so that's static friction and kinetic friction. Uh, and the things that I describe are primarily for this example. Um, if you think of sort of more general situations, um, then if there is slip, and what do we mean by slip? By slip, we mean basically that there is relative velocity between the two surfaces, right? So this surface moves against the surface. In other words, rubs against the surface uh, effectively. It move, the two surfaces have some relative velocity. That's what we mean by slip. Slip means relative velocity between two contacting surfaces. Um, so in the general situation, when there is slip, the friction force magnitude is mu k times n, and the direction is basically exactly opposite the relative velocity. If relative velocity is in one direction, the friction force is in the exact opposite direction. If there is no slip, in other words, the two objects are not initially slipping, then the friction force equals, so here is like a super important sentence. When there is no slip, 
in this simple example when there is no slip in this simple example friction force was exactly equal to fvxt as long as um, friction force was less than us times n but more generally when there is no slip friction force is whatever it takes to avoid slip as long as friction force is less than this maximum friction okay this is kind of a mouthful but the friction force is whatever it takes to avoid slip but with that, with the constraint that the maximum available friction force is mu s times n any questions about this principle we will see an example of what this means in a minute um can people still hear me okay yeah 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 okay sounds good okay so so that's coulomb friction um i suppose coulomb was uh from the 1700s i suppose uh, scientists from the 1700s also partly responsible for the law of electrostatic attraction coulomb's law um this these um equations of friction have been attributed to a few different people uh leonardo da vinci actually um coulomb and uh, another person called amonton but in any case from all about from about 3 400 years ago um okay so how do we implement this stuff in a practical problem usually the dilemma or the question is whether there is slip or not okay as long as there is slip then if there is slip the friction force is easy it's just mu k times n um as as long as you know in which direction the thing slips right it's mu k times n and then you put it uh, directly opposing the slip direction um that's if the objects slip against each other uh but sometimes the quest like you don't know whether the object will slip or not that and this is a problem you may have again seen in your statics problem or statics course and this is the dynamics version um so there may be a question of will sort of will there be slip between two surfaces and under what conditions uh will there be slip like what forces are required to um make one object slip against another object right um so when you are asked a question like this um this is a procedure for following to follow to actually figure out whether there is slip or not um if if you're asked will it slip or if you're asked under what conditions will it slip um you start with assume that there is no slip basically right assume that there is no slip and then after making that assumption compute the friction force using basically f equals ma okay you compute the friction force using f equals ma kind of things uh, in other words you're not allowed to use mu n because when the things are not slipping um it's not necessarily equal to mu n right so when things are slipping it's mu k times n but when things are not slipping it could be less than mu s times n okay someone has a question um will we also be covering tipping too that's a good question we will be covering that perhaps in 3 4 weeks um trenton has a question but yeah uh, but that's a different topic um so right now we are considering that's a good question um right now we are considering sort of particle mechanics so we are not really considering orientation of objects um so we don't but but we will talk about orientation and changes in orientation and so on in two or three weeks i suppose so we'll talk about um uh, tipping i guess then um but but uh, yeah so so for slipping you first assume that there is no slip and then you compute the friction force assuming that there is no slip using basically f equals ma and you are not allowed to use mu n here whatever kind of mu n you're not allowed to use that here um and for this you just put f friction in whatever direction you please and you just solve for it if you assume the wrong direction and you will get the negative uh version of it and so on the direction will take care of itself in this in this version 
um, when things are not slipping. Okay. You can assume F friction in any direction and the solution will take care of the direction. Um, so that's a key idea. Um, when you have no slip. Um, so once you've computed the friction force, um, and then you say, is this friction force less than mu sub s times n? If so, no slip, else there is slip, okay? So that's, that's the procedure. Assume there is no slip, compute the friction force using basically f equals ma, and then uh, see if that exceeds the static friction available. Uh, uh, if it does exceed it, there is slip. If it doesn't exceed it, there is no slip. Any questions about this? Wait, if there's slip, do you use the mu k n equation then? Yes, exactly. If there is slip, then you would, uh, yeah, right. So if, if all people are asking uh, is will it slip or won't it slip, you just stop here. You say you, you find the condition so this will give you the condition, basically. You would get an expression or a number or F friction, and then you can compare it with this quantity. And if it's less, no slip, if there's greater slip, uh, and you will just stop there. And then in addition, if people ask, okay, what are the acceleration for various objects? Then um, you're exactly right. You would then assume that there is slip if, there, if this condition is violated you would assume that there is slip and then work out the whole problem by assuming that the friction force is minus mu k n and so on. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes. Perfect, cool. Okay, so here is a problem, um, an example of will it slip, won't it slip kind of thing. Um, and uh, here's, here it is. Um, so you have two blocks. It's kind of the simplest problem maybe that uh, could involve these kinds of issues. Um, two blocks, M1, M2. Um, you have this first block being pulled with force F. I've not provided numbers, but you can imagine a version with numbers here. Um, and uh, the friction coefficients between this mass and this mass are mu sub s and mu sub k respectively. Um, imagine those, those are given some values, but, but um, the friction coefficients between this mass and the, and the slope are basically zero. No friction here, some friction here, okay? And you have some external force. Um, and then the question is under what conditions or, or you might be asked, write down the conditions under which M1 will slip on M2, um, et cetera. Or what should be the value of F so that M1 slips against M2? Or what should be the friction coefficient so that M1 uh, slips lower M2? So the question could be asked under various sort of combinations. Um, but they all have the same procedure, okay? So basically we're asking, will it slip for some given values of all these things or more generally under what conditions will there be slip between these two masses? Of course, between this mass and the slope, there's gonna be slip because there is no friction. So as soon as you start pulling it or letting go of the system basically, there will be slip here, but the question is whether these two masses will slip against each other, right? Obviously, if the static friction coefficient is huge, there will be no slip sort of compared to the forces. Um, if there's like a very large static friction coefficient, that's basically like the two masses being welded to each other, then there will be no slip. But if the static friction coefficient is not quote unquote large enough, then of course, there will be slip here as well as slip here. That's a high level intuition, right? Okay, so all these problems start with free body diagrams slash sign notation, sign conventions, right? So let's first do free body diagrams. Um, let me zoom out ever so slightly, maybe. Okay, so Let's draw the free body diagram for this mass, the first mass. 
where we have F uh, and I've already decomposed it um, as mg sine theta down the slope, mg cosine theta into the surface, normal reaction then one on the mass, friction force, and then of course the external force. Okay, so those are all the forces on mass M1. And then um, on mass M2, uh, so here's where you want to be a little bit more careful. Um, if you say the friction force is in this direction for mass M1, you want to say friction force is in the opposite direction on mass M2. And because we are going to be assuming that there is no slip, basically, right, because we are doing this problem, we start with assuming that there is no slip and then sort of figure out the consequences of that. Um, so because we are doing that, we can assume F friction either this way or this way, totally fine. We just happen to pick it going backward, totally fine to pick F friction sign convention to being go as going forward. Everything will work out, you'll get the same answer, okay? Or the same uh, answer up to like a, a flip in the sign or something like that, but basically physically equivalent answers. Um, so we just picked randomly that the friction force is backward, which is probably where, where it's going to be, but you don't have to know that. Just assume some direction, and then assume, and then this is going to be the opposite direction because equal and opposite forces. Uh, I suppose uh, every action has an equal, equal and opposite reaction, the same famous Newton's third law. And similarly, you have N1 here. We have the equal and opposite N1 on M2. Um, and then M2G sine theta, M2G cosine theta, and then N2, which is a different normal reaction. Any questions on the free body diagram? Okay. We okay, actually have a question. Oh, uh, go for it. Uh, it's probably a little silly, but why isn't there a reaction force? I just kind of forget from physics, but why isn't there a reaction force of N2 on? the one block? Uh, good question, right. So um, when we draw a free body diagram, um, we are, uh, we basically make a cut. When, when, when we say free body diagram, we basically are isolating um, that object from the rest of the world, let's say M1, right? Um, so you've isolated that object from the rest of the universe and then you're uh, philosophically sort of, this is the logic or the principle of a free body diagram. You're isolating that object or set of objects from the rest of the universe and then you're replacing the effect of the rest of the universe on that object through these forces that are acting on that object. Okay, so what are the forces? F, which is directly being applied on this object. Mg is being directly applied by Earth on this object, force at a distance. Uh, friction, so the only other things that can act at, uh, the only other thing that, um, well, let me just uh, talk about the two other forces. Friction, friction is a surface force, um, so it acts at this surface at the bottom surface. Um, and there is normal reaction between M, M, M1 and M2. Um, N2 is again this sort of surface force, right? And like both the friction force, uh, let's just focus on this picture. Both the friction force and the normal force are basically surface forces. They have to do with surface-surface interactions, okay? So this N1 is the force of this mass pushing against the other mass and vice versa. And this friction force is the force of this mass rubbing against the other mass and vice versa. N2 has to do with um, this surface and like the M2 surface and the slope surface interacting. And this surface is sort of far away from the surface and really has nothing to do with the surface in some sense. So that's why N2 is not put on this mass because N2 is a property of 
basically this surface. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? So there are certain forces that are action at a distance kind of forces, which are like gravity, electrostatic forces, etc., where that there doesn't have to be actual uh, what like maybe physical interaction is the wrong word, but actual contact. But basically every other kind of force that basically needs to be contact, um, except for these special kinds of forces, um, friction, normal reaction, uh, springs, um, et cetera, et cetera, all, all is basically communicated through contact. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, like tension and strings um, in pulley problems, right? Only if uh, pulley is connect, only if the string is connected to a mass, will that sort of force it, it, exactly the same idea. But this is an important question. So I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Um, um, okay, so that's a free body diagram. Um, and then like we said, we assume no slip because we are trying to test whether there is gonna be slip or not. Um, the, the procedure is assume no slip, find the friction force, and then check if the friction force is greater than static friction. That's the idea, okay? So we say, um, so what does it mean to say no slip between this mass and this mass? How is that? reflected in the accelerations. They'd be equal. Exactly, right. If there's no slip between these two masses, uh, however this mass is moving, this mass will also move in the same manner because there is no slip. So if you say acceleration of this is A, this is also A, right? So, so no slip means both, both masses have the same acceleration, A. Um, and then, uh, once you've made that sort of um, inference, you just do F equals MA for both these free body diagrams. You do F equals MA along the slope, F equals MA perpendicular to the slope, acceleration along the slope is A, acceleration perpendicular to the slope is zero. So this is what that, is, that comes down to, I guess, let me see if I can put them both in the same page. Um, Um, yeah, so you have F minus M1 G sine theta minus F friction equals MA. So that's one equation. Um, and then perpendicular to the slope, you have N1 minus M1 G cosine theta equals zero. Um, that's this equation. So along the slope, perpendicular to the slope for free body diagram one. And then free body diagram two, we have F friction because that's actually up the slope now. And then minus mg sine theta, which is down the slope. And those are the only uh, forces along the slope. And then uh, that's equal to M2A. And then, um, and then perpendicular to the slope, we have N2 minus N1 minus M2G equal to zero, okay? Um, so how many equations? Well, I guess I've revealed the answer there, but we have four equations um, and four unknowns um, in the sense that, well, we have introduced these four quantities, N1, N2, A, acceleration, we don't know what it is, and then friction force, we don't know what it is. Everything else you can assume to be given. You know, they're kind of the premise of the problem. These, all these things are given in the problem, okay? Um, so you can solve for those four unknowns in terms of the other quantities, basically M1, M2, Gs, uh, theta, um, I suppose that's it, right? So you can solve for these unknowns in terms of M1, M2, G, and theta. Um, and basically in particular, you can solve for the friction force. Um, and then, well, if you're given numbers for everything, that will be a number. Um, and then you can compare that number with the number that you get for mu s times n1. If um, the friction force is less than mu s times n1, then there is no slip. But if the friction force is greater in magnitude than mu s times n1, then there is slip. Someone has a question on chat. 
Um, Han asks, when we do f equals ma equations, when do we have to use vector notation and when do we not? Um, we've kind of been informal about this in some sense. Um, it's a good question. Um, so basically, when um, it, when, when it's possible or relatively easy to just do f equals ma in, in particular directions, um, then you just do scalar f equals ma, right? So scalar f equals ma in this direction, scalar f equals ma in this direction, that works. Of course, that's equivalent to a, a, like a single vector f equals ma. They're completely equivalent, right? So you can do either or. Either is fine. Um, like if you assume this direction to be i and this perpendicular direction to be j, which, which would be a convenient thing if you wanted to do it that way, like define coordinate systems for this problem, um, then you would just say total force equals fi minus m1g sine theta i uh, minus f friction i plus n1j minus m1g cosine theta j, right? So you write vector force and then we'll say equal to mass times a times i, and that's it, because acceleration is only in the i direction here. So that would be a vector free body diagram, which is completely equivalent to these two scalar free body diagrams. Did that make sense? Okay, so Han, was that clear? Um, Iron asks, um, uh, would it count, um, let, let me complete Hans' question, I guess. Yes, so basically if you break it up into components, you can just do scalar com equations, absolutely. Yeah, that's the short answer, yeah. So you can do scalar or vector, basically they're the same, where scalar you're basically using components, yeah. So Aaron asks, um, uh, would it count as no slip if f friction equals uh, f friction max? Um, that's a good question, and and uh, Trenton sort of addresses that, I suppose. Um, the answer, if you are really frank about it, is complicated. <laughs> um, yes, I think it would be uh, in, within the purview of this theory it would be considered impending motion and no slip. That's exactly right. Uh, because uh, the forces, um, the forces just, the force is just equal to uh, the maximum friction coefficient. Uh, and and uh, because that force sort of balances everything out, uh, you will not begin slip yet. It will be impending motion. That's exactly right. But, um, so that's certainly true for the purposes of this course and, and uh, this theory or this model of friction. But um, let me sort of go up one more level, sort of uh, um, if, if you are looking at a real world problem, uh, if you are in the, on that boundary sort of situation when the force is exactly equal to mu s times n, then um, probably um, all bets are off, I suppose, because it, it relies on things being exactly true to the millionth decimal place that you will never be able to check something like that. If it's ever so slightly to one side, it will start um, slipping. If it's ever so slightly to another slide, side, it will not slip. I guess that's one answer. And the other answer is um, these kinds of um, models, so, so Coulomb friction, um, let me make a remark similar to the one that we made about Newton's laws, right? Uh, Newton's laws we said were accurate up to 10 to the minus eight. Like basically the theory of relativity and objects traveling close to the speed of light is what starts breaking uh, Newton's laws. It's pretty accurate for most normal purposes. Coulomb friction on the other hand is actually not that accurate. Um, um, if you actually measure the friction coefficient of a surface uh, today, and then you measure it tomorrow, the same surface, it's gonna be slightly different, unfortunately, it turns out, surprisingly enough. 
um, it may be different by a couple of percent. If you're unlucky, it may be different by 10%. Um, so it, it's, it's very hard to have like a super precise, from, from a practical perspective, it's very hard to have a super precise static friction coefficient and so on. So from a practical perspective, that exact slip versus no slip sort of, um, it's hard to confidently say anything about that, I suppose. Does that answer your question, Aaron? But for the purposes of this course, um, yeah, no slip if you're exactly at that point, yeah. And if you wanna know like why does friction coefficient changes from day to day, uh, it turns out that's because uh, friction is a surface phenomenon, right? And, and uh, a surface is one layer of atoms, right? So uh, basically the top few layers of atoms of one surface interacts with the few layers of atoms of another surface. That's really a property of these two surfaces, like a few layers of atoms. Um, and if you have like dust in the air, uh, the dust settles on the surface, it, that dust can change the friction coefficient. If you have humidity in the air, it sort of gets absorbed into the surfaces, that humidity can change the, because it just requires a small amount to contaminate like the top layer of atoms, I guess. So that's the sort of deeper scientific answer. Uh, friction coefficients are not that reliable, I guess. But, but still pretty good and, and remarkably all of engineering relies on these kinds of models. But, but if you're doing like more precise, say vehicle dynamic simulations, we would use more complicated models of friction that take into account uh, more effects, I guess. Okay, um, so I think, um, does, is this, are people satisfied this, with this answer or should we actually solve for it? I think I, I was planning on skipping the solution. Uh, well, anyway, we only have five minutes to look, looks like. Um, so uh, any questions about this? Oh, Han asks, doesn't it ask for slip? What, uh, I didn't quite understand. Yes, under what conditions will M, M1 slip on M2? Yes, so that is the question. So um, the way you would answer that is, yes, so this is the condition for no slip. And then the condition for slip is once you solve for F friction, you say the condition for slip is F friction magnitude is greater than mu s times n1. Does that answer the question? 